Welcome to our first Wise Denver event. We're going to be doing this like teacup thing in the chairs all night, so bear with us. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Alex Adamson. I lead the efforts here at Wise. This is our first time being in Denver, and I am so impressed and so excited to see all of these faces here. This is such a great group, such a great turnout. Um, I think everybody's kind of hearing that Denver is becoming this amazing market, but like this is proof that it's definitely somewhere to be. Um, so usually at the beginning of these, I'll ask for a show of hands for everyone's first WISE event, but I assume this is everyone's first WISE event. Is there anyone in the room who's been to a WISE event in one of our other markets before? Okay, so a couple, a couple of folks. Um, for a little bit of context, WISE was started at the end of 2017 really as a passion project focused on advancing the careers of women in sales. Um, we have since made this a full-time company. Um, we finished 2019 in New York, San Francisco, Boston, Chicago, London, and Toronto, and we'll finish this year in 15 markets. Um, Denver is one of those, so we're very excited to be here. I would first also like to thank some of our amazing sponsors in the Denver market. If you are from a sponsor company, give everybody a wave when I say your company's name so they can come find you. Our sponsors make WISE possible, so please, please, please show them some love. Sales Loft, I know we have some lofters here. Handshake, <laughs> Udemy, who's hosting us tonight in their beautiful office, and Segment. I know I saw Segment's, yes, okay. <laughs> um, so tonight, we have three incredible sales leaders to talk to us a little bit about their journey in sales, how they got to where they are, um, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, but big round of applause, first and foremost, for all three of them. We have Mallory Wheaton, the manager of employer account management at Handshake, Mallory Mosk, sales manager at Udemy, and Caitlin Sullivan, senior manager of customer success at Marketo. <laughs> Mallory, you wanna kick us off? Yeah. So I have to hold myself steady <laughs> on Caitlin's chair because mine keeps turning into her. So I don't wanna turn my back on you guys. Um, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, I work here at Udemy. My name is Mallory Mosk. I currently manage um, two parts of the business development function here in Denver, so the SDR group, which handles inbound leads, and then the ADR group, which is more um, partner with our um, enterprise account executives and working to kind of get into the account base, um, uh, attacking with them by territory. Um, I've been in Denver for about two years, and it's amazing to see this market grow. I moved here June 1st, 2018. This feels like an entirely different place. Um, prior to working at Udemy, I was with a company called Funding Circle in the peer-to-peer -peer commercial lending space. Um, I moved to Denver for the job at um, Funding Circle. Um, we were opening a new office, so I liked it so much I wanted to do it again when I came here to Udemy. And um, I lived in San Francisco for five years before moving to Denver. So if any of you have made that type of move, and I'm sure a lot of you have, let's chat afterwards because I'm sure it's, it's been a good move for, for you too. Um, at Funding Circle, I was an IC and then moved into management, and before that, I worked at Yelp as an IC for several years, um, originally from Southern California. Nice to meet all of you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Caitlin Sullivan Daniels. I just recently got married. Um, woo! Woo! <laughs> um, so I am originally from the Bay Area. I uh, went to school at Sonoma State and got a uh, bachelor's in economics. I started what I would call a traditional sales career about eight years ago at a company called Demand Force. I was there for three years, started out as an SDR, worked my way to AE, and ultimately became a manager there. Um, I did decide that the net new world wasn't quite my sweet spot, and so started looking for more account management or working alongside with customers, but wanted to have the opportunity to still manage. Um, so made that transition over to Marketo about five and a half years ago. So been there for quite some time, and uh, uh, during that time, I have lived in three cities and have... Uh, grown from being a manager to a senior manager to director, got demoted when Adobe bought us, back down to senior manager, but um, all in all, it's been a wild ride and really, really have enjoyed it. Um, one thing that I think is important, part of my story that I've experienced both at Demand Force and here at Marketo is quite a bit of change. Um, 
while I was at Demand Force, we went public and we also got acquired by Intuit. Luckily, I left prior to them getting rid of Demand Force. But um, when I made my way over to Marketo, um, we were acquired by Vista about a year in and then ultimately sold over to Adobe. So I have definitely seen a ton in my uh, short tenure in my sales career. Hi, everyone. I'm the other Mallory, Mallory W. Um, I currently lead our account management function at Handshake. So I lead a team of quota-carrying account managers responsible for renewals, upsells, cross-sells, and then a little bit of prospecting into our long-tail customers. Um, prior to Handshake, I worked uh, and held like various roles, customer-facing roles at Zenefits, um, which is another startup, um, kind of long forgotten. And... Um, Prior to that, I started my career at, um, at a consulting firm. So I did systems consulting right out of school. Uh, and Handshake is like super focused, much like WISE, on, on career opportunity, career tra trajectory, not just for women, but for all students across the US. So super excited to be here and talking about a personal passion, which is career pathing. So to kick it off, I'm going to ask the whole group. Tell us a little bit about your first sales role. Did you even realize you were in sales? Because I think every bit, a lot of people start out in sales don't even realize they're doing something in sales or they were a Girl Scout and didn't realize that they were selling things. So tell us a little bit about your first sales role and, and what that experience was like. Um, I was a Girl Scout. My mom was our troop leader. So it started at age six for me. Um, my second real sales job was I worked at a surf shop. Um, I'm from San Clemente, California, like right, city right on the beach and um, decided to get my first job at age 16. And I was um, a competitive swimmer growing up. So I had two practices a day, most days during the summer from eight to 1030 and then from two to 5 PM, including weightlifting. Like it was, it was a whole thing. So I worked at the surf shop for three hours in the middle of the day, like saved my skin, some of the sun damage. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was in retail, right? And I had no idea like what I was doing, but surfboards are really expensive items. And I'm not really a surfer, like yeah, I can surf, but I'm not like a surfer. So we have these pro surfers who live in Orange County and would come in and kind of look at boards and wetsuits. And again, this stuff costs several hundred dollars. Nice boards cost 800 to a thousand dollars. So they're like, this looks nice. And I'm like, yeah, this looks nice. Like you should take it home. You should buy it sort of thing. Like no understanding of discovery or like asking questions about what they're looking for in terms of board width or height or what the purpose is, if they're a long board or short board, or like no concept of that. You just kind of saw people in like board shorts who showed up to the surf shop and I thought, oh, they're probably gonna buy something because they're looking at surfboards. So um, I've come a long way since, since that time um, and taught me, uh, I, didn't, I guess I didn't take a lot away from it other than the fact that I, I knew nothing. And when I was going to, deciding on what college to, to attend, um, I was one of those people who, who had no idea what I wanted to do in school, and my parents are both in business and sales and enterprise level selling, so kind of talked me into a business degree, and so I was able to translate the surf shop experience as I pursued my career, or I'm sorry, pursued my um, concentrations in college, I was able to pick classes in leadership and marketing because I knew that I really like to communicate with people, and I really like to um, understand their motives and goals and objectives, and that's kind of helped me decide to get into where I am today in the sales leadership space. So the, the role before Demand Force, I worked for a company called, uh, well, started out as University of Dreams or Dream Careers. I don't know if anyone participated in it, but basically it was a paid for internship program. And so we were selling, it was a for-profit company and we were basically selling an experience that included an internship during the summer. Um, had no idea that I was selling as people were purchasing this, but I think it was just such a, um, 
kind of fun environment where I was working alongside a lot of people that were also just out of college. And then we got to run the, the programs during the summer. So the, the role before Demand Force actually uh, brought me to both London and Dublin, um, where I got to spend uh, two summers basically staffing this program. So, um, but back to the question, like, no, had no idea. And then when I got into my role as an SDR, that's where the real work started. And big shout outs to anyone who started as an SDR or still is. That's a hard role. Um, so I started my first ever selling job. I sold couches at West Elm. And I'm really kicking myself because the employee discount is 40% off. And 18-year-old Mallory did not appreciate. Um, I, I think it, it, it taught me so many things. I, I was such like a classic, shy, polite 18-year-old girl. And I hated asking for things. And in West Elm, you're commission-based. So you have to sell couches to like adults. But also you have to like upsell them on credit cards. Anyone who works retail knows that that's like actually a traditional upsell. So I think it like really helped me hone the skill of like asking for things of people, especially of clients. And I think everyone in the room who, even if you're not in kind of a traditionally, what's traditionally considered a sales role, like an SDR or an AE, like I think any customer facing role, you have to have those selling skills, whether it's like convincing someone to pay you or convincing someone to use a product in a certain way. Um, and I think us as women, like you just kind of got to jump in the deep end and, and start asking those questions um, and sell a few couches. So Caitlin, I'm going to volley back to you. You've been at a lot of larger companies. Um, you've had many different roles at those companies. How did you set your up, yourself up for those internal promotions? Because I think asking for things and asking for promotions and kind of being your own best advocate is something we talk to a lot of women in the community about as a pain point. Um, so tell us a little bit about it, how, how you did that. So, I mean, obviously there's a ton that's involved, but I think I can break it down to two really big things that have helped. One is embracing change. As you can tell from my story, I've seen a lot and been through a lot. And I think being able to keep some semblance of moving forward at the organizations as they're going through change really highlights a, a, a very strong um, kind of commitment and asset to that company that has really um, resonated well. Um, for my overall career and so I know it can be very difficult during that time because you don't know what's going on you don't really know what's next but you know the job at hand you got to do or you generally have some just you know understanding of what the business is trying to accomplish start there embrace the change as it's coming and be flexible to the to the kind of changing strategy the second thing and I think now I'm realizing that most of us up here and probably a handful out there willingness to relocate that un honestly was probably one of the biggest things where I I you know I raised my hand and I said I can do this by the way give me a title change and I'll do it and they did and then um, it, it has you know allowed for me to do a lot more um, kind of career building or resume building skills I never would have been able to start a team from scratch if I wasn't going to come out here to Denver and help open up this office. So little things like that, while I know a move may not be possible for some people, if you did have the opportunity to, I gotta tell you, even for a short time, could really mean a lot to the, to the company in your career. And Mallory, on the same note, you've been at Handshake for three years now, a few different roles. Walk us through that story. Yes, many, uh, many tours of duty, as our CEO says. Um, so I, I don't think I like went in to Handshake thinking like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna manage universities, then I'm gonna be a CSM, then I'm gonna be an AM, then I'm gonna manage a bunch of teams. I think it was, there's this, there's this awesome quote, Hunter Walk is like a, a seed stage VC firm and he just tweeted the other day, if you like a company, take a role, don't matter, like don't think about what the role is too much because in six months, if you work really hard and you kick butt, you're gonna have a different role, and then in another six months, you're gonna have a different role, and like, for obvious reasons, that resonated super, uh, super closely with me. I think I, when I went into it, much like what Caitlin said, like embracing change, being super flexible, raising your hand for things that you want, but also instead of thinking about title progression, thinking about like skill gaps and experience gaps, 
and what's going to round out my resume six years down the line, not like six months down the line, um, has served me really well. And I think that like, uh, especially when you're like super, when it's a small startup, like I'm sure many of us work for, when you're super trusted, they give you opportunity that you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, my first ever IC revenue management role was like managing all of Handshake's customer revenue, like every single dollar, which um, you would be insane to give a person off the street. So um, it worked really well. Uh, it worked really well for me. Um, and I think, again, like it's just about raising your hand and like taking different opportunities to craft the right narrative for your career. Yep. <laughs> do you know where this is going? Similar story. Um, you, funding Circle for four years. Mm -hmm. You've been at Udemy for just under a year. What were some of the things that you evaluated when you were making the move? What were some of the triggers that told you Udemy was going to be the right choice? Yeah, um, I think it's helpful to describe why I went to Funding Circle originally from <clears throat> a company like Yelp. And I actually, Mallory, did work at Zenefits for a short four months between Yelp and Funding Circle. Um, in 2015, so it's kind of a crazy time. Um, um, I was in this small, like working with small businesses at Yelp. I called into Chicago and parts of Northern California and parts of Oregon there, and I really liked the concept of fueling small businesses. So um, <clears throat> Funding Circle's mission is all about helping build a better financial world for small business. Um, and I didn't know a thing about credit when I was going there, so that was my challenge, was to understand like what do small business owners care about and what does their P&L look like and what type of bank statements are they supposed to provide to lenders like us um, on a given month in terms of income and spend and all that type of stuff. So that was a big learning curve for me, but I knew how to sell. Um, Funding Circle did a lot, a lot, a lot there. I started out um, in the, an account management position on our partnerships team, so was, I was working with large brokerages um, one was a big one was called Fundera over in New York. So I supported like 30 sales reps over there and they were sending me deals and I was doing all the AM work and communicating the loan details and all that. Um, I moved into that relationship management role there. I moved over to um, serve as an IC on our direct sales team. So working with the business owners directly, was promoted in management, was an SDR manager there for a bit, managed uh, up to 17 account executives at one time there, moved to Denver, ran an AE team here. And honestly, like, I was exhausted. Um, it was a four-year sprint for the most part. Um, in 2017, our direct sales channel, which I was managing, um, grew at 279%. Yeah, over the course of a year. So um, we hired people, but we didn't hire as much as we stretched the team, and that stretched me personally. So um, <clears throat> we went through an IPO last September, to September 2018, and, um, once I left in April, I was like, oh my God, I need a nap. So um, I took a couple months off and um, I learned a lot from the experience at Funding Circle. So I was trying to sleep and rest up and just get my bearings straight again, but also um, think about my next job. And what I really liked about Funding Circle is being able to lay like the groundwork down and build a foundation for future success. Um, I was employee number 110 maybe at Funding Circle in the U.S. business when I was hired in 2015. So I wanted something small, again, where I could have a huge impact in areas I know that I'm strong at, um, which I think include uh, onboarding and hiring people, um, training, and um, driving strong performance. Um, privately held companies are interesting to me too. Again, I think you can have some really solid impact. I also wanted a company where I would experience high growth, which meant being really flexible, being able to be really flexible again, and um, rolling with some of the punches and like just kind of dusting my feet off and saying, let's do this again. Um, I was also looking for an org that was mission driven and Funding Circle is, is very mission oriented. So the concept of providing better education to people all over the world um, is something that I didn't I suppose didn't know I, I valued until I met the team here and was like, oh, oh my gosh, like this is this is absolutely it. Um, I've been here for six months as of last week, and so I'm still new and learning the business, but it's everything that it's um, that I thought it would be um, initially coming on board. So, been an absolute fun fun ride, and yeah, those decisions are starting to happen, right? Like the uncomfortable stuff. Um, us growing globally is is not something that is always easy on my on me or my team, but. Um, 
I think I've built a lot of resilience from my last roles and can carry it over here pretty well. Everyone's kind of mentioned this idea of taking on a role where you don't know how to do everything. Um, and I read a stat a while ago, I'm sure everyone here is semi-familiar with it, but women won't apply for a job unless they hit 100% of the bullet points, everything on the JD. Men will apply if they hit 60%. Um, I want to open it up to the group. The, the benefits of raising your hand, putting your name in the ring, even if it's something you don't know how to do, this kind of mindset of like FITFO, you can figure it the, out. Um, I had a boss who used that term, and I loved it. It stuck with me forever. Um, but I think a lot of people don't give themselves credit. They actually do know how to do it. So let's open that up, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, sorry, I feel like we're ignoring the West Wing over here. Um, <clears throat> I, <laughs> meaningful eye contact. Um, so I think that um, I lost my train of thought when I was making a joke. Um, so we were talking about taking on a role, even if you don't, yep. Uh, so I did have something meaningful to say about it, which is that um, I think that especially in, I, I think we're like, we were surveying the audience and, and many of you all are in smaller companies or startups or places where contextual knowledge matters so much more than years experience or you having the job title before. And whenever I like would raise my hand for a role, but like get kind of scared that I don't, like I haven't done this role before, I don't have three years experience, um, I don't like look super old or super experienced. Will people trust me as a manager? Things like that. I think I like think about the idea of onboarding someone externally. And if that idea is like so much more painful than doing it yourself, then like you should absolutely do, you should absolutely do the job. And that's been kind of like my barometer about how scared I am. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, talk about imposter syndrome. I mean, prior to getting up here tonight, I'm like, why am I going up here in front of everyone and telling my story, right? I think it's part of overcoming some of that self-doubt and getting in front of opportunities that scare the crap out of you. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think about Marketo when I first started, completely different ball game for me. It was account management, not net new. It was way more complex and sophisticated. Um, they, not that this matters, but like things like a job description didn't exist. I was part of a, a, a greater plan for the organization. And so showing up to work was kind of like, well, what can I do to make an impact and make myself seen and heard? And I think the biggest thing is, you know, getting your hands dirty. You were hired for a reason, you have a brain, you have some intellect, you probably know how to interact with human beings, do some semblance of those things every day until it starts to make more sense. Um, and I think, you know, uh, a lot of that pays off and um, a lot of self, we're going to be our worst enemies. So remember that Sometimes you won't have the confidence in you, but the people surrounding you do. And again, you were hired, and I try to actually instill that myself when I can. I have a new hire right now. She came to me. She told me she's very overwhelmed. And I said, yeah, you're going to feel that way for, for quite a bit longer, but I know that you are capable, and so let's, you know, let's figure out a way together. Yeah, my, <clears throat> my advice to this one is put your name in the hat. Um, almost always. Uh, make a calculated decision on it, too. Like, I think taking chances with your career um, early on and, and is, is great if you, can, if you can back it up, right? So I think try to, to position yourself to be the obvious choice for the job. Do things that the person in that role would do on a daily basis. Like, make decisions um, with a strate strategic hat on like that person would make. Position yourself well, but don't have expectations um, if it doesn't go your way, right? There's nothing really wrong with being really, really, really good at your job. Like, there's nothing wrong in being current, like great at your job. And I don't think we appreciate that enough, especially as women. We like get to a certain level of competency, and we're we're kind of like, all right, ready for the next thing. Like, dust it off, let's go. But um, there's something to be said for relishing and success. And uh, 
but being able to, to take the chances and at least advocate for yourself when you know you're a good fit for the next role, it's, you have to do it every time. Um, I wouldn't be in Denver if I didn't do that with, with Funding Circle. Um, so I was one of three manager, sales managers there. They actually asked someone first who I knew wasn't going to take the job because I talked to him before. And I was like, oh, it's me. <laughs> and so I just went to the HR team and I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move. And they were like, well, we didn't ask you. I'm like, well, you're going to ask me like right now. So this is me telling you that we're, we're going to do this thing. And it, and it worked out great. Like I, had, I didn't have experience in running an office and being the, the salesperson to grow the sales team, but I'm so happy I did. And it's led me to you, to me, and to be able to be in this great, great space with awesome people. So do it every time. Mallory, I'm gonna volley back to you. You hit, or you wrote this amazing post when you hit your three year mark at Handshake. And it was basically, everyone should go on LinkedIn and read this. It's it's awesome, but it's basically a letter to her dad being like, I did it, I'm here through for three years. And this is a great, it's a, exactly what I wanted and more. But I think sometimes people are nervous to take risks on new things because of the optics, right? Like, what's my family going to think? What are people externally going to think? What's the feedback I'm going to get? Um, can you speak to that a little bit and, and this idea of taking risks and maybe not worrying so much about what everybody else thinks? Yes, thank you for the LinkedIn shout out. Uh, you all should go read it. Uh, Personal Brand Matters, uh, which is why you should write LinkedIn blog posts. Um, so uh, my dad's been at the same company his whole life. Uh, is the context behind this. And so he obviously thinks I'm a, to a total insane person that I have think three years is a long time or that I stayed at a job for less than a year and things like that. So I think that the way the startup community has normalized this quite a bit where like you've, the, the period of acceptable time has obviously shrunk. But I also think that there's like so much um, like fear around taking risks. I joined Handshake, I was one of the like 20s. There were 20 people when I started, and so um, it wasn't a real thing. It was in a really crappy office. It was scary, and uh, for a number of reasons. So I think it's like when when you have the freedom to be flexible with your career. I'm unmarried. I don't have kids. If I lose my job, my parents live 45 minutes away. Like I can take risks, and those risks have paid off so well for me. And I think for all of us, like uh, take the risks when you when you can. Uh, because the upside is like so much higher than like plugging into a role that feels super safe. Um, and then to uh, Alex's question around like the perception and things like that, I think for me, I've always just like pulled my, um, everyone always talks about like have your own executive board and your board of mentors and things like that. And for me that those aren't necessarily people who I like aspire to be, but peers I really respect. And so pull them, temperature check with them, temperature check with your, the dads of the world and um, kind of the more senior advisors. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, that'll give you like a pretty good read on whether you're like taking like a high yielding risk or like a stupid career decision, um, which I'm sure none of you would ever do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mallory, piece of advice you feel like you're constantly giving your teams over and over again. We're going to do one like quippy question for everybody before we get to Q&A. They're right back there. No. Um, <laughs> uh, I actually did ask the team about this because I, I think I talk a lot and I think we talk a lot um, <clears throat> as, as a team. Um, they're... I think I talk a lot about like building your brand um, and finding ways to become indispensable to your organization. And to do that, it's not like you, you kind of come in and you're like, okay, like everything's exciting. And to, to some degree, yes, that, that is the case. All the you know ERGs are really cool and there's running group and there's culture committee and there's all these ski club and there's all these things. Um, and if you go that route, that, that's fine to dip into to, to every, a little bit into everything. But at some point you have to scale back and figure out what you can invest in, um, your time and energy in. And uh, you, you can also be more deliberate with it too. So um, any way you go about it, I think it's incredibly important to figure out what those things are that, that you're passionate about and where you can make a big impact. Um, being selective for me has been the better way to, grow, to, to go in my career. 
Um, I've been a part of culture committees at my past organization, um, at this organization, and, and Udemy, I'm, I'm a part of it too, and um, specifically, the reason I have chosen to be a part of it is because um, I'm one of very few sales leaders here, and um, we have the build, ability to build something great structurally from the ground up in this new office. And we're hoping to build out to um, 100 people by the end of this year and 300 by the end of next year. So Udemy, in, in terms of um, map, critical mass, is, is going to get big here in Denver pretty soon. So what's important to me is, you know, helping lay a foundation of what good culture should be and good communication between teams should be. Um, so other ways to be indispensable, I mean, there's, there's no, building relationships is everything. Again, I think you have to be selective with that, and I'm, I know we're gonna get into to mentorship in a little bit, but, um, uh, figure out what skills you want to learn and identify someone who exhibits those skills and that confidence and contact them and set up some meetings. And again, I think if you go into it with, with few expectations other than what you hope to get out of it and provide some value back to that person, it's going to be a good relationship. But do be intentional. Caitlin, on the mentor topic. Yeah. Someone you least expected who ended up being a mentor. So this person wasn't the least expected, sorry, but I still think it's super relevant and I want to say it. Um, I thought it was really simple and sound advice and it came from um, uh, a woman who was not my manager at the time at Demand Force, but she had been my manager and somebody that I still always would go to and still occasionally do to kind of uh, check myself a bit, and I had gone into sort of this new hybrid role. Funny enough, it was actually called the retention role, which now that I'm in renewals, it's kind of weird that I didn't like it at the time, but it didn't fit. Um, and she was like, listen, you are talented enough to figure this out and can do it. Do you want to? Is that where you feel like you're thriving? You're excited to come to work? If it's not, figure out something else that makes sense. That's simple. <laughs> One more before we get into Q&A. Mallory. <laughs> One piece of advice you would give your younger self. Um, I think, like, ask for what you want. And I don't think that, I think that's, like, that would be my that would be my short answer. Um, I think like ask for what you want, ask for a new job, ask for what you want, ask to like leave at a certain time so you can go take care of your kids or go to the gym. Um, ask for more stock, even if you don't know what that means. Just ask for more. Um, I certainly still don't, um, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. But I think that uh, yeah, I think just like as women, we're conditioned to like not ask for things and to be quiet and to do our jobs exceptionally well and just do them. Um, so I think like that, uh, that advice applies across the board. So we have about 10, 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, we do have a couple of quick Q&A rules. Please keep questions to about 30 seconds and keep them relevant for everyone on the panel. We'll have time after this. If you have a specific question for one person on the panel, come up, grab them, they'll be around. Um, if you could just stand up and say your question, then I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. And we know everybody's hiring, please, no shameless hiring plugs. <laughs> um, you'd be amazed. Um, so with that, who wants to kick us off? Um, so my question is, I've been hearing a lot about and become very interested in this idea of showing up with your whole self to work. Um, I think with women especially, we're kind of held back from that and we kind of compartmentalize. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on it, if you guys do that and how. Great question. So the question was um, this whole idea of bringing your whole self to work, how you guys do that um, successfully. I know this is a bit controversial, but I don't know that I believe that it's just business. I think. I get when there's a need for the business and I need to separate my um, personal feelings from the situation, but I think, 
you know, one really great example, I mean, prior to going off to my wedding, my entire team, some of them are here, did an entire like toast and send off to me. That is not something you do if it's not bringing your whole self to work and being, and being personal. I also think I would be super ineffective if I did not show up fully with all the passion. I will say I've had to temper some of that passion because it's come out a little bit loud and irrational sometimes. So I think there's, there's probably a balance, and that's learned with kind of testing the boundaries. But I just think that the way that you're going to be your best self in anything is assuming that you have to show up fully to it. Um. <clears throat> I care a lot about this. At Udemy, we have a value um, which is earnestly authentic. I love that. It's incorporated into one of our, our four values. Um, something that's helped me <clears throat> do this a little bit better, like exemplify my true self at work, I read a book um, called Radical Candor, which is by Kim Scott. It's amazing. Um, it's inspired me to say what I want to say at, in the moment, right? For me as a sales manager, it's helped in a lot of ways, I think, like, drive better performance out of my team. Um, if there's any, like, lingering weird feelings, everyone feels it. It's not just you. Your rep certainly feels it. Your team feels it. Just call, call it out in the moment and solve for it then and there. So it helps with the kind of, like, velocity of decision making. Um, it helps build trust within your team, which is, like, the foundation of any high-performing team. If you don't have that, you're not going to have anything. Um, so that book is a good source of inspiration. I recommend reading it if you haven't already. Thank you for the question. Um, I think t super tactically for me, this uh, is when I first entered into sales, my models of excellence were like really sharky, really aggressive men. And I'm like so not, I'm like so not sharky. Um, and more of a minimo, 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 minimo. That was, I had a... <laughs> Minor epilepsy on stage. So anyway, I, I like lead with like a very intellectual sale. I lead with like a really relationship sale. I do challenge because we've all read the challenger sale and we know that that works. But like I don't, I'm not going to swear on the phone. I'm, I'm really not. Um, I'm not going to like yell on the phone. I'm always going to be super diplomatic. And for me, there were no pictures of success that looked like that. So I felt like I had to change. And the only thing that got me past it was just doing it and doing it just as well as them and like proving to myself that with the numbers that like this approach works too. Um, the easier way to do that is to find people who look like you and talk like you and do the sale like you do that are also successful so that you don't feel like, so you don't feel super alone in it. Anybody else? For people who might not be total extroverts, um, being firm, knowing what you want, not coming across as a pushover. Me again, the minimo. Um, so um, I, I super resonate with this question. I think uh, for me, what helped me is uh, when I know I'm going to face objections, writing out like the tree of objections. So like super tactically, I'm gonna ask for this price. I know they're gonna throw up on it. What am I gonna say next? Um, like things, things like that, that, and then couching things like in a, I totally empathize with your situation my deflect, like my boss, my finance, who, my whoever, help me get, give me the confidence early on to like actually stand firm because at the end of the day, like it isn't your fault. You're being told, like you're just doing your job. You're being told to do something and you're being told to hold firm. So just tell them that. And if you have a good enough relationship, be like, I was on the phone the other day, like, hey, Jared, I hear you. Like, I can't go tell my CEO that. Um, and they get that, they're, they're battling uh, their own internal battles. Yeah, I think um, Mallory 
kind of said it well as far as the writing down in particular for me. I, I feel like I'm probably, um, I'm, a, I'm a bit outgoing, but I can definitely sometimes not have the aggressive nature in me, especially if I'm talking to a customer or a prospect. And so kind of writing word for word what I'm going to say and anticipating that kind of at least gave me some semblance of what I felt like was control in a situation that made me feel very out of control. And I mean, not to be super um, cliche, but like the more at bats you get and the more you practice it, and I can't emphasize like like um, sparring or role playing, they're the dumbest and most uncomfortable things, and gosh, do they work every single time I am more prepared. And so it's doing things that are just feeling like they're silly and dumb, but just, again, getting uncomfortable. I've practiced making eye contact deliberately with people um, for a long time because it's something I've shied away from. Like if, I, if I'm on a, on a Zoom call, excuse me, with my counterparts over in San Francisco, sometimes I'll find myself kind of like doing this thing. But it's little, little things like that help. Like standing up when I'm making phone calls, um, even when I'm interviewing a candidate for the very first time, I think I come across with more, have more energy and more pep in my step and can articulate, as I'm crisscross here, um, articulate things more clearly and a vision for this organization if I, if I do those little things. So it's, yeah, it's practice. It's practice with your friends, with your partners, with your manager, practice, yeah. Okay, this might be kind of big, so I apologize in advance, but I feel like you might know what I'm talking about. So I know you mentioned that you haven't had like job descriptions in the past, and you've been managing SDRs and stuff, so when you're coming from a small startup and you're trying to build a company and grow a new team, something you've never had before, how do you go about like managing a team and growing this team when you're kind of learning with them what that job description is? That's a good question. So knowing how to manage and grow something when you've never done it before, you're figuring it out alongside your reps. Did that encompass it? I think I understand it, and that's very much how I felt when I, again, first started Marketo, and I think the number one thing you can do is, is get your hands dirty and do it alongside them. Um, number one, that's how I started learning the role that they were doing and understanding where, like, I needed to figure out a way to develop them, but I had no idea what they were doing, so I had to get some semblance there. That also is sort of helping the overall, like, what is this department supposed to be doing and what is the business outcome? And so, again, I. I I, I don't want to simplify it. I don't think, I mean, a lot of late nights, for sure, a lot of extra work, a lot of upfront, um, uh, you know, pretending I know what I'm doing and then going home and studying. I, I mean, I looked up words on Google that I had never heard before and then realized they were Marketo jargon. <sighs> Different story. But um, so, I mean, there is a lot of that actual work. <laughs> But a lot of it is just maybe doing the job and doing the job alongside them and then moving forward and... Um, I think the last thing I'd say on that is it's okay to say I don't know, and you can say that, you know, I know it's really scary to say it. I did learn that actually from my boss, and, and sometimes that it can be frustrating when he says that to me now, but I think what it does is it, it, it really showcases you can use other people to find out information. Go. Um, I think it starts with making a plan like understand what your hiring goals are for the month and quarter, um, work backwards from there, really communicate with your recruiting team on wh where you're at in the whole you know, employee life cycle um, from a recruitment standpoint. Um, I think with your team, identify the, I mean, in, in, in the way I've done it is in a 30, 60, 90 day um, process, um, which was my interview at Udemy. Like identify the things that I think are important and then ask the team, like are these also, am I in line or have I totally missed the mark? But when you join, you do understand, you know, as of day 15 or so, like what, what the top priorities are. So I think make a plan um, for 90 days, six months in, whatever, and then um, have the outcomes in mind and then work backwards from there. Um, something that I've done is I use time blocks on my calendars and I actually ask my reps to do this as well and really try to stick to that certain activity. So from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning, I do recruiting only. Then I shut off for that for pretty much the day. I check a little bit at lunch what's going on in Lever. Other than that, that's, that's the activity and that's done for the day. Um, I set aside time to be on the desk with my reps. 
um, and don't really let anything else interrupt that time because it's, I think it's really, really important to get to be able to have those moments to get on the phone, dive into live calls, shout out Sales Loft, um, <laughs> and then listen to them afterwards. Shout out Gong, if any of you are here too. Um, so it's being intentional with, with time. I'll just add one more thing on like the team dynamics piece of that, which can be really challenging for me when I was like a team lead and like basically managing a team, but not officially their people manager while I was also an IC. Like you, um, you, you, ha you never have more conviction around your decisions than when you're doing the same thing as your reps are doing. So like really trust your instincts there. Um, and you know, when you're grow or even if you are their manager and they know that you're early, an early manager, or you know, they know that you're also doing the job alongside them, like pick two or three that are really, really good and name it to them and be like, yo, we're all in this together. We're learning as we go. Help me. I'll help you. And then at a certain point, you'll like be confident enough that you like cut off the line and then you no longer, like, you'll still always have those two like special people. For me, it's like one or two special people that I like read in on everything. They're my sounding boards. They're like, I, tr I trust them like I would trust a peer. And then, and that gives you just like a little bit more confidence and they'll back you up too. I'll add on to that too. I think tasting the soup consistently is good. So like knowing that you should be parachuting back in regularly, even once it's like figured out, just to know what's going on. And then beyond that, I think it's a trust thing with your team. Like I, my reps know I will never ask something of them that I haven't done or am not willing to do um, because I've done it next to them time and time and time again. So I think there's something to be said for that. I think we have time for, ooh, we've got, Two, ooh, another hands are coming up, okay. <laughs> I saw you in the back first. So I think just being in the sales role, we're kind of all doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Just kind of want to hear your thoughts on like how you guys keep like the passion alive in your job. Sales can be a lot of repeat work and it can feel mundane sometimes. How do you keep the passion when you're doing a lot of the same tasks? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it totally is a challenge. Um, as a sales manager, um, I am inspired by my team and my team's performance and what they're able to achieve. So a lot of times I talk to them about like financial goals that they have for themselves and Denver is a great market. People are able to afford houses here. So a lot of people on my team are looking to get married and buy these big you know, big, invest in big things like cars and washer dryers and cool stuff like that. So that's, an, that's a fun conversation to have with people. And I, if I can have a, a small direct impact on, on, on that financial freedom and ability to invest and build their lives out here, like I feel like I've done a good job. Um, from a personal standpoint, yeah, I think sales management is like a little less re repetitive um, as I'm having different conversations every day and have um, you know, different new hires, people come and leave the business, get promoted up, leave, whatever. So um, from a personal standpoint, I, I think about um, like the skills that I'm, I'm missing out on and also the things that I'm really good at as a sales manager. So I, I probably fact check myself like once a week. Um, I don't mean to like shameless plug you to me here, but I'm going to. Um, we have a cool tool that we use internally called our learning paths. So essentially it's a web page where you can build on, um, build on it. It's a list, right? You're building a list of um, Udemy courses or HBR articles um, or books that I want to read. So that's kind of like my my task list. So I dedicate about an hour to to invest in that those areas per week. Um, I often dip into it like a lot more than just the allotted hour, but that's a way to keep me um, inspired and focused. And I share some of of what I learned with my manager, so he knows that I'm. Um, I'm uh, inv invested in, in growing my own career and um, can, can take the time to do it. Because I think a lot of us probably don't have a moment in the week where we, we dedicate you know, an hour, an hour and a half to do it. And you're like, it's Sunday night and I want to watch TV and I don't want to do the thing. I don't want to take the course. I don't want to read the book. But um, I do it during, during the week. So it actually breaks up my work week a little bit. Those are a couple ways that I stay inspired. She said it really well, but I think that's the biggest thing is what, what can you do to maybe 
create some opportunities for yourself to learn a new skill set or build on a skill set while you're having some some repeat. I think you'll eventually, um, if you've mastered your craft, maybe it's time to move on, you know, think about new opportunities. Um, but I think Mallory over here said it really well. Uh, side projects is the only thing I would add to that, which is probably an obnoxious answer, but I think that like, at like, uh, whether it's becoming like the AE who knows the most about this section of the product or uh, the documentation expert or the product liaison that's like championing that. But like if you're if you're really truly bored, then um, go up segment, find a new role, find a new company. Also, like talk to your friends about what they're doing and what they're learning. Um, uh, I started reading a lot like five years ago, like a lot, a lot, um, about, like a couple books a month um, at one point. So I think reading has been an awesome way to open my mind up and I try to alternate between um, like sales heavy book and then a fun book. So I run a book club here at Udemy. It's something, again, what we're doing on the side to inspire this culture of learning. Um, we read The Challenger Sale uh, last and we're reading Becoming by Michelle Obama this month. I think we have time for one more. Right here. Is that you? Go for it. Uh, this may come off as like pretty dark, but can you talk about it? <laughs> well, you're right here, you're not me. Can you talk about a time when you like failed ethically as a leader and then the lessons that you learned from that that you took with you? That's a great one to end on. Yeah. Um, a time where as a leader you ethically failed and what you learned. <laughs> so when I first made my way out to Denver, um, it was the start of the entire company being out here. Um, part of our strategy at the time was let's open up like a vibrant sales office out in, in Denver. Let's hire, hire, hire. Let's get a full team staffed and ready to go. And um, we were able to hire the team that we needed to. And I think as, you know, the first quarter goes by and we, we're, we're kicking butt, like we're calling it a success, we're throwing in the towel kind of thing. And over the, the course of the next uh, couple quarters, you know, it became clear that there was probably quite a bit of enablement that hadn't taken place and just like continuous rigor with um, our uh, CSMs who, um, I forgot to mention, do carry a quota and renewals and, and full growth. And I think there were things that individuals were able to pick up along the way and the ones that um, kind of understood what they were going to do, kind of gravitated where they needed to go. And then there sort of created um, uh, so that. And then there was sort of like this mad mob mentality. Like things were just going awry. And so as we were closing out the, the second year after Denver, I mean, I, I've, I've definitely said out loud that was one of the hardest years in my life because it was just so like... I guess humbling would be the word. I went out thinking like, this is gonna be amazing, like I'm growing this team, I got promoted, yay. Um, it was not, it's not easy. And I think when I look back on that, I think it's really, again, um, an experience that I'm gonna use as, again, my own self gut check of, you know, am I, doing, am I doing this the way that it should be done and am I continuing to put the rigor into it? Any other failures up here? <laughs> nope. Um, I uh, I lost our biggest customer last year, so I think um, I think probably anyone who who manages relationships in this room knows the like gut wrenching feeling uh, when you can't sleep because you know the biggest logo is going to turn. So I think that that is like taught me a ton about humility and also like prioritization of your accounts. Like if you know that like the board knows about this logo, then like pay attention, like pay more attention to them than any literally anything else you do. Um, and I think, um, what else do I have to say about it? I think that like the reason if your manager comes out, down on you hard because of churn or if your director does or if your CEO does, it's literally because it like for some reason is the thing that the board, the board always cares about the most and needs like a detailed reason why because if people are churning, it means you're building an unsuccessful business. In this case, it was kind of an isolated issue, but like I think that like we all, we all fall on our face um, and we all make the wrong decisions about how we spend our time. Um, at Funding Circle, I <clears throat> made some mistakes in hiring, and when I think about that, I think like, is it me? Is it is it is it 
the way I trained the team? Is it the way, the culture that I built or is it the hire themselves? I, I don't know to this day. I, I'm <laughs> going to say it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I hired about five people who, who like acted and thought the exact same as each other. And it's really hard to understand that in a panel interview when you're talking to them for an hour. Maybe you had an hour and a half of time with them before you call them with their, their offer details and they're super excited. But um, like culture starts with hiring and the people you bring in the door. Um, so for me, but, and it turned out to be a, a really scary situation for the culture of the office. Um, these, this group like got disenfranchised a little bit with the team. They started coming in late, leaving early. We were working primarily off inbound leads, so it really, really hurt the business in a, in a significant way. And if a few people aren't at, at, at work, um, like it could really impact revenue for the day. Um, in the business of online lending, um, every day really mattered, and speed to lead was everything in that. In, in that world. So um, a lot of them left, like a lot of them just decided they needed, they needed to go and do something else and they're in a good spot now. But um, when, so what, what I've learned from that experience is to, to hire for diversity and diversity is cut a million different ways, but it is so, so, so crucial. Um, in a sales environment, you kind of look, as a hiring manager, you kind of look for the same qualities in people, like desire to be in sales, like the no brainer. Like, <laughs> If you tell me you want to be in accounting, I'm going to tell you there's the door. Um, uh, uh, commitment to the mission of the organization, right, is another one. Um, high energy, um, past success with achieving goals, great communication. Like, these are some things that you, you look for, the standards. But from there, like, uh, diversity all the way. Um, diversity in thought and education and work experience and, and all of it counts. That's going to wrap our panel. As I said, our lovely panelists will be up here to answer more questions. We are here for about an hour more, so feel free to mingle, grab more food, grab more drinks. Thank you all so, so much for being here.